Welcome again to the 2022 Emergency Preparedness and Infectious Diseases Regional Institute. We're excited to have you join us in person and online. You are in the long COVID-19 prevention and treatment control session. My name is Carmen Sanders. I'm a member of the Macaw Tribe and I serve as a public health project coordinator with the National Indian Health Board. We are joined with Dr. Natalie Holt from the Great Plains Area Indian Health Service. Dr. Holt will discuss, um, uh-oh. Yes, sir. We stop sharing. No, they stop the whole. Okay, sorry. <laughs> 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 Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Um, she joins us from the Great Plains Area Indian Health Service. Dr. Holt will discuss how to distinguish long COVID from other medical conditions such as lung or heart disease. And she will also share evidence-based therapeutics for self-management. Thank you very much. Just wanna see, uh, do you think my uh, slides are gonna show up on the screen here as well? For those of you on the call, can you see my, uh, my screen right now? Off or on? Yeah. Was around May of 2020 when a when a physician recounted his experience with COVID, and then has been taken up by social media and the like. So um, uh, it's kind of quite an, quite an interesting evolution um, as we struggle with COVID now to, to deal with this, uh, this rationalization that this is not going to be just an acute illness that people get over and uh, necessarily. Um, so this is what we're here to learn about. And, you know, uh, want to start with just the basic definition of long COVID, which has been quite a challenge in and of itself. When you look at trying to characterize a new condition, first you have to agree on what that condition is. So a lot of this has, has been trying to figure out what are we going to define as long COVID. And so we're going to talk about the two that have kind of come to the top in terms of their popularity, that defined by the CDC and the WHO, World Health Organization. Um, so here, just to give you an idea, you're going to hear the terms in the literature and on social media, long COVID, post-COVID syndrome, long-haul COVID, post-acute COVID, post-acute sequela of COVID. Really, this is on one syndrome. And I say we think because that's the truth. Uh, we think that long COVID is one illness set. But right now, we are too young in our knowledge to really even figure out if all these individuals that seem to have persistent symptoms after a COVID infection are suffering from the same illness from a pathophysiological point of view. So here's the CDC's definition of long COVID. They've described it as the occurrence of new returning or ongoing health problems four or more weeks after an initial infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The uh, World Health Organization has taken it into a little more granularity. Um, they, they've uh, defined a, a post-COVID condition or long-haul COVID as any individual with a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV um, infection uh, presenting typically three months after the onset of their initial symptoms. Um, and symptoms that persist for at least two months. And I want to emphasize, can't be explained by an alternative diagnosis. Uh, the common symptoms that are pe people are reporting are quite vague. Fatigue, shortness of breath, difficulty with attention, memory uh, problems. Um, and, and so, uh, the other problem is that many people have a situation in which some days they feel well and other days they seem to have a reappearance of symptoms. So this is a waxing and waning course. So the important thing here is that unfortunately there is no test that can tell a provider if an individual is suffering from long COVID. Consequently, from a provider's perspective, you're always trying to look at the things that you don't want to miss that actually do have treatments 
before you give someone a diagnosis such as long COVID, where you're going to be in a scenario in which you're not going to have a specific treatment that can get someone better. So that's why we use the term diagnosis of exclusion. Okay. So I just emphasize those two points. There's long COVID that might be causing all these diffuse symptoms. Then there's a ton of other things that could cause these. And, and if those other things have treatments, for example, you have a sore throat, sometimes it's viral, sometimes it's strep, right? If it's strep, we can give someone an antibiotic, right? If it's viral, that's not gonna work. And so, so that's where this has become very complicated. Not only are we having trouble with the definition, we also have no ability to confirm that, that, that whether a person is suffering from long COVID. So it's quite complicated from a scientific point of view. For that reason, you can imagine that trying to figure out the prevalence, how common this, this condition is, is also quite difficult. Um, and, and, and we'll touch on that. I wanna, I wanna say that, um, even before COVID, providers have known for a long time that when people get a serious infection, particularly when they get hospitalized, need to be in an intensive care unit, there are long-term consequences of, of something like that. And many of us have experienced that. If you have a serious illness, even if you break your leg or you break your arm, it takes time to recover. You may recover from an initial surgery or procedure, but recovery in the sense of getting back to your initial um, point of function and energy, that takes longer. The body gets deconditioned by the consequences of any acute illness. And this is, and COVID is no different. So, so what I mean by that is that even before long COVID came into the literature, there were conditions that had been defined um, as a consequence of either getting a severe infection or from being hospitalized, particularly in the intensive care unit. And these are conditions that I've listed here. So we could be dealing with a post-sepsis condition. Sepsis is just a blood infection, right? That, would, that could be COVID, could be anything. Um, then there's the post-intensive care unit syndrome. If you've had a relative who's been in an intensive care unit at all, it's very common for people to become confused in those settings, for them to lose their ability to distinguish night and day, for the sleep to be disturbed. Because anyone who's been in a hospital setting knows it's not the most relaxing environment. There's always things going on, people poking you, people, people shoving tubes in you, and, and all of that also has consequences. The other thing is that, as we know, COVID uh, seemed to more severely affect those who had pre-existing medical conditions like diabetes, like high blood pressure, etc. Some of us, just because it was difficult to get health care during COVID, those conditions also got neglected. So some of, of, the, of the symptoms long term that patients with COVID are experiencing could be the result of their chronic conditions getting worse over that time frame. So it's very hard to parse that apart. And then as I mentioned, you know, complications of treatments. Uh, I work in a hospital. Sometimes you feel like the longer you spend in a hospital, the more sick you get at times. You know, you, you know it, it's, it's an environment in which the interventions are, are often life-saving, but they also come with costs, right? There are infections associated with every tube that somebody gets put in for an IV or a bladder catheter or whatnot. There are treatments like steroids and, and antivirals. They're very powerful medications. Unfortunately, every medication has a side effect. And some people are unfortunate enough that they may get treated from their original condition with the medication, but then suffer the long-term consequences of being exposed to a certain drug, all right? So that's what I mean by complications of treatments and then complications of interventions, as I mentioned. That you're sitting in a hospital bed for a long time, you can get blood clots. It goes into a spiral, unfortunately, uh, of acute illness that is not unique to COVID itself. It's just the consequences of the complexity of being hospitalized with a serious condition. So just to give you a, a, an idea of what we know about those syndromes, so the, the so-called post-intensive care syndrome is that the literature tells us that uh, 
physical weakness, muscle wasting, is reported in at least 50% of people who spend a week in the intensive care unit. Cognitive dysfunction, difficulty thinking, difficulty with memory and attention is, is very, very common also, probably uh, at 50% or so at least. Um, as is the mental and emotional stress of being in a, a setting like that. There's a fear of dying. There's a, uh, there's a separation from family members. Um, there's the lack of knowing what your prognosis is. So it is clear that people who have experienced a serious illness um, and a life-threatening illness um, often have difficulty with sleep, with anxiety, with depression, that outlasts their, their hospitalization. So this is, once again, information we know before COVID. Then there's the more unique uh, definition or narrower definition of post-sepsis syndrome. So we mentioned sepsis is infection, right? And so COVID is one infection, then there's lots of others. Post-sepsis syndrome, we also know prior to COVID, is a very deadly disease. Uh, people survive their initial severe infection sepsis episode, but many of those people that get hospitalized end up being readmitted to the hospital within the, the, the year after their release. One third die in the year following their sepsis episode. And uh, probably 15, 20% have ongoing physical disabilities. For example, those people who might have lived alone, independent before an event of sepsis are now feeling like they can't do that anymore. They can't go get their groceries by themselves. They can't make their meals by themselves. So, so this is just a context that before long COVID, we knew that serious illness causes long-term health consequences, even if you quote unquote recover from that initial illness. So now what do we know about long COVID? I find this really interesting. Um, the uh, U.S. Census is trying to get some information from the surveys that they that they do uh, throughout the United States about uh, patients' experience or people's experience with long COVID symptoms. And this is some data that they've been uh, releasing, um, which uh, essentially shows that about 40% of U.S. adults are reporting that they have had COVID. Uh, 35% report that at some time after their acute illness, they had long COVID symptoms. And at one that one point in time in the survey, about one in 13 said they are still having long COVID symptoms. All right, so this certainly tells us that this is not a rare occurrence. I think it also gives us some hope in the sense that if 35% reported that they had long COVID symptoms at some time, but seven and a half are reporting current, I do feel like there, there is some hope in that data in the sense that it appears that the trajectory of the long COVID symptoms does go on a downward trend for most people, all right? So I think that's some of the news. I chose to, to, to portray this in the United States uh, uh, um, map version here because I think it's quite interesting. The darker green is showing a higher prevalence of patients currently experiencing long COVID. And if you know it there, the Midwest, particularly South Dakota, right where we are, is actually quite a bit higher than the coast, the, the East Coast, the California. And, and you know, I can't, I can't decipher all that this data means. But if you think about uh, the fact that by and large, cases of COVID first appeared on the coasts. They took a little while longer to get to rural areas. So I'd like to think that possibly this is showing us that there is some hope that we will get into those light green areas too, because we're lagging a little bit, both with acute COVID and possibly with the trajectory of long COVID. Anyway, so this data is really emerging and it'll be interesting to follow. And that is what we've got from the United States. There are some other data from international surveys that do potentially show that maybe that's an underestimate of how many people 
after acute COVID infection develop long COVID symptoms. Uh, there's reports more in the order of 35 to 54 percent of patients reporting mild acute COVID symptoms that persist um, two to four months after their uh, in, in infection. And interestingly, there's quite a number of people, the majority in fact, that report uh, symptoms that either resolved or reappeared after they felt they already got better. So I wanna talk a little bit about risk factors. Um, as COVID as an acute illness evolved, we learned things about risk factors for acute COVID. Uh, older individuals appeared much more likely to be hospitalized. Those with diabetes, uh, obesity, those became risk factors. The risk factors for long COVID are probably less well known for many of the reasons that we've talked about. Difficulty with the case definition, um, difficulty with diagnosing, um, however, I'm going to give you what, what's out there. It appears that hospitalization during an acute infection does increase your risk of experiencing long COVID symptoms, but we'll, we'll kind of qualify that as I go on. Seems also that females are more affected by long COVID uh, compared to men. Interestingly, as I just mentioned, mortality with COVID was definitely highest in the very old age group, okay, 80 plus. The age group that appears to be suffering the most with long COVID symptoms is actually in that middle age group, more like the 40 to 54 range. So that's quite interesting. There's some data suggests that if you had a higher viral load, meaning more virus replication during the acute infection, that could also predispose you to, to, uh, to experiencing long COVID symptoms. And possibly as a correlate to that, there are some studies that suggest that those who got COVID who were unvaccinated are more likely to experience symptoms than those who are vaccinated. And those two may be related in the sense that if the vaccine is not uh, totally effective at preventing infection, it, it certainly has good evidence to show that it has kept people out of the hospital. So, so there's probably some relationships there. This is once again data from that census poll I was telling you about. And this is showing what I just mentioned, the fact that really it's that 40 to 59 age group that's showing the highest percentages of people reporting long COVID symptoms. In the 80 year and above is actually the least likely to report those symptoms. And then down below in the other uh, red, red arrow I have, I'm just noting that the, the cisgender female, transgender does have a higher prevalence in males for, for long COVID symptoms as well. Now I mentioned that uh, it appears that those who are hospitalized are more likely to report long COVID symptoms. But this is kind of some interesting data. There's been a, a group uh, who have been looking at individuals who are hospitalized in Wuhan, China, China um, and they've been able to follow them for a year now. So they reported what, what they looked like at six months after hospitalization and then what they looked like at a year. And in this study, this is the results of their six month data. What they did here is essentially take all the hospitalized people and put them through some pulmonary studies. One of them is something called a six minute walk test where you walk six minutes and then they, they um, evaluate uh, your oxygen saturation, certain other metrics. And then the DLCO, that's like a, a way to show how well is the lung exchanging gases, ex oxygen and carbon dioxide. The patients were uh, divided into three groups represented by the three bars. One group, they, these were all hospitalized, I should clarify, but one group were hospitalized but didn't need any oxygen. The, that's the blue group. The orange group required supplemental oxygen, but by nasal, by, by external means. And then the, the, dark, uh, era, the dark bars are those who required pressurized oxygen or actual um, uh, mechanical ventilation, being on a ventilator. What this shows us is that interestingly, if you look at the first section there, the six minute walk test, 
not only the, did those who required mechanical ventilation being on a ventilator have impaired results on that study after six months, so did those who didn't require any oxygen during hospitalization. And actually, they're all kind of neck and neck with each other. So that's kind of interesting. That's showing that even if they didn't have the degree of lung damage during their acute infection to require oxygen, nevertheless, they're showing signs, subtler but present signs, that they have weakened pulmonary function after six months. So that's where I say that, interestingly, the severity of your acute COVID symptoms is not directly correlating with your experience of long COVID symptoms. And the, the, the DLCO is also showing the same results. Here, when it came to more formalized pulmonary function tests, those who require men mechanical ventilation are definitely not doing as well as, the, as those who didn't require mechanical ventilation, didn't require oxygen at all. Nevertheless, all of them were affected. Or affected rather. Okay, so now I want to talk about a few more symptoms and uh, I'm sure I missed something. Okay, a few, few other symptoms. Uh, talk a little bit about why we think they occur and evaluation treatment options. So this is a super busy slide, but I wanna, wanted to show it because I think it's so profound. This is a study, uh, actually a review study that collected all different, different research on the prevalence and variety of long COVID symptoms that people were reporting. And on the list on the left, what I've pointed out is the ones that are most common. By far, fatigue, all right, headache, Attention disorder, meaning like difficulty concentrating. That's a common theme. Persistent shortness of breath or some sort of impairment in breathing or cough is also fairly common, as is some mood-related effect, depression, anxiety, all right? But you see here, the, the symptoms are all over the map. Every organ system. Why every organ system? The COVID virus gets into the body cells via the this so-called receptor, something that's sitting on top of the on top of the cell's membrane, and it, it inserts and enters the cell, replicates. That something is called the angiotensin converting enzyme ACE2 receptor. This slide is showing us that. Even though when COVID was going on, we focused on the lungs, the ACE2 receptor, the virus's entry point into the body, occurs in lots of different organs. So that is more logical when you think about why do people have long COVID symptoms that appear to affect every organ system, all right? So... What did the virus do? In the acute phase, the main problem with the virus is that it appeared to elicit a cascade of events that really revved up the body's inflammatory system, okay? And so don't need to get too down in the details here with this, but there's essentially a, a very complicated renin and angiotensin system within our bodies, and it's got kind of a good side and a bad side. All right, and essentially the virus ramped up the bad side and stomped down the good side. All right, so those are the technical terms on that. But bottom line is a inflammatory response, a propensity for clots, a propensity to grow such so-called fibrosis, which is essentially tissue that that is is like scar tissue all right and that's why you know in the in the case of the lungs that is normally these are nice fluffy cells that allow us to exchange oxygen and and carbon dioxide right what happened in the lungs is this inflammatory response elicits cells that essentially create scar tissue and that scar tissue no longer can do those oxygen exchange functions, all right? So that's kind of the, the, the basic version of what the virus did in the cells. 
And this is a little bit different depiction. A kind of uh, everyone, I think, responds to pictures different. But this is what I was kind of showing you. Um, that essentially think of this as the the pro inflammation fibrotic thrombotic side getting overcome as a result of this imbalance created by the virus. And and again, we don't have to go into super. Uh, detail about this, but the story in each organ system is basically the same. The virus binds through this ACE2 receptor. It, it elicits a response which revs up all of the inflama inflammatory cells in, the, in our body, and it creates this environment in which effectively scar tissue is created. All right, and so in the in the case of the lungs that response in terms of a patient's symptoms is shortness of breath difficulty exercising and when we take pictures of a lung if someone takes a ct scan what you typically are going to see is instead of nice black cells with light white you're going to see white you're going to see scar and that is something that, that uh, a, clinicians would see as ground glass opacities and, and pulmonary fibrosis. Should emphasize ground glass opacities, pulmonary fibrosis, those are, those are the results of a lot of different illnesses. So unfortunately, that's why they don't, they don't really give us that diagnostic clue either. They just kind of paint the picture that says, geez, it seems like this person may be suffering from long COVID. So from a patient's perspective, what, what does this look like? As I mentioned, persistent cough, usually a dry cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, those are the most common symptoms. Some people tend to also experience um, more on the order of palpitations, dizziness, which is worsened by exercise. The, um, the pathophysiology also suggests that some of this may be that when the virus affects muscles, it essentially weakens those muscles, causes a fibrosis type reaction in muscle, which can affect people's breathing. So that may be some of this as well. In terms of evaluation and treatment, uh, the tests that, that are recommended at this point is really first to to exclude other conditions, right? If someone has these symptoms, a doctor is going to want to make sure this isn't any sort of acute heart problems, uh, that this isn't uh, any sort of other acute lung problems. So the tests that you're going to do are not specific for COVID. They're more, or, the, or long COVID, they're more in general. Do, is your heart showing any signs uh, of, of dysfunction? What is your what are your breathing tests showing us? And so, generally speaking, you know, we like to ramp up from the things that are least invasive to then most invasive. So, simple tests like the six minute walk test that I mentioned, another test called a timed up and go. You literally sit on a chair, get up, walk around, and you do that like five or six times, and it's timed. And if you have problems with that, it tells us a lot. It tells us a lot about your ability to do light exercise your physical strength and your muscles getting up and out from a chair. So there's a number of things that you can get from, from very low, low cost tests like that. So that's what you want to do first. As I mentioned, someone may decide, particularly if a patient comes in, usually they don't have one thing wrong with them. They might have a history of smoking. They may have exposures, right? So if you go the route of a CT scan, there are some things that could lead you toward more likely to say this could be a diagnosis related to COVID. And as I mentioned, that is the ground glass opacity is the whiteness in the chest that you may see. And uh, we talked about sleep, sleep uh, disorders. Some people, if they're really describing problems with their sleep, you may evaluate them through sleep studies. OK, um, by and large, the, you know, the message on all these slides is going to be that it's we don't know enough to be throwing medications at this problem right now. There's many medications under study, and I'm going to talk about them because they're very interesting. But 
the treatment for long COVID as a general rule is going to be more on the rehabilitative side than it is going to be throwing another drug at something. Okay. And so uh, generally speaking, that's going to be a graded exercise programs, breathing programs, um, really uh, things that, that need to be done in a multidisciplinary fashion. And, and many major medical centers are developing clinics with that in mind, that this is multidisciplinary. This is physical, but it's also emotional. If people are depressed. They're not going to want to do things. They're not going to get up and do exercise. So there's a lot of components here. I, I threw a few threw, threw drugs out there because I think it's always interesting to know what's on the horizon. In general, the drugs for the lung uh, complications of long COVID are the ones that we would use for patients who had pulmonary fibrosis from other reasons. So they're particularly, all those drugs, if you think about what we talked about with the pathophysiology, right, the high inflammatory state, all these drugs like the prednisolone um, and the profenadone, those are all things that try to bring down the inflammation, that block the mediators of inflammation in the body to try to reset that balance, all right? So cardiovascular, same, same kind of thing. Uh, gets into the blood cells, causes this cascade, which leads to myocardial injury, can show up in, just like even a heart attack would show up in, some patients get elevated troponin markers. Then you seem to have this, this replacement of efficient tissue in the, in, the, in the heart with tissue, this fibrotic tissue that does not pump well, does not, it does not do the, the actions that our normal heart, heart uh, uh, does. So here, and we'll talk about it a little bit in more detail later, um, symptoms are mostly on the order of uh, 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 myocarditis, which is like a low-grade inflammation in the heart. A couple of the unique things that, that we've known about a syndrome called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, all commonly seen as POT syndrome. We've known about that syndrome in the medical literature for a long time. It's typically very rare and most commonly associated with, with the females of childbearing age. But it seems that with acute COVID, certain fraction of patients with long COVID are experiencing symptoms that we would, we would say are characteristic of POT syndrome. And that's a very complicated illness that causes a, um, a lot of debilitating um, uh, uh, symptoms for patients chronic dizziness, uh, feeling like they just have no energy. Um, most patients with POTS, it's severely affected their lifestyle. Um, in young people, you may have heard this in relation to the vaccine, but also in COVID, a, pay, a long COVID is a unique type of inflammatory or fibrotic condition, particularly in young, and, and it seemed to be a little more common in males. We'll talk a little bit about that. But evaluation here, once again, you're going to be evaluating globally for heart function. Your electrocardiogram that, that, that you get in the doctor's office. Echocardiogram, that's something that you can get um, uh, to show how the pumping action of the heart is working. And once again, you're not going to be looking at specific treatments for long COVID. You're going to be looking at what treatments can increase the efficiency of that heart pumping action or whatever you see in those pictures. For POTS in particular, there's a beta blocker called propanolol, and there's another drug which affects the electrical activity in the heart, Aberdeen, which have probably gotten the most attention in terms of POTS syndrome. But once again, these are all in a research phase. They really are not enough to, to be recommending as a, as a cure-all by any means. So people have been very curious about how the um, virus gets into the brain. Of course, we all heard a lot about people's smell being affected, right? And so there's some evidence that actually the, um, the virus can migrate through the nerves in an upward fashion. They also seem to, the viral effects seem to affect, uh, seem to have in, uh, affect the blood-brain barrier, this kind of holy grail, if you will, that separates the blood from the, the cerebral spinal fluid. 
So there's many things, but once again, same theme, inflammation, neuroinflammation. That seems to be what's causing people's neurocognitive uh, memory issues, headaches, etc. So as I mentioned, these are very diffuse symptoms. Headache, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, um, prolonged, if not lack of smell, but it, different smell. Many people will say they, they do not smell the same as when they, before they had COVID. Here again, you know, little research, but when it came, comes to the, the nasal symptoms, probably the most common thing you see being tried is nasal steroids, nasal irrigations, fairly low risk. So that's something that, that um, you know, I think is, is, is reasonable for, for a physician to consider at this point. There's olfactory retraining. That, that is actually a, a thing now. There is part of a rehabilitation program to, to kind of essentially retrain your olfactory system. A couple more on these. Rheumatologic fatigue, pain, fibromyalgia. These are very, very nonspecific symptoms. Generally speaking, the evaluation is going to be um, difficult. Treatments, most providers are going to go in a graded approach. Try the least invasive things, non-pharmacological things, acupuncture, physical therapy. TENS is like an electrical stimulation that you can get on your skin. That sometimes helps people with pain syndromes. Personally, I find a lot of interest in some of the nutritional things that are being discussed with long COVID. Um, some patients do have recognized electrolyte deficiencies that can be subject to repletion. Um, mood related, we're mostly going to antidepressant type drugs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, uh, those are probably the most common, very good safety profile. And again, you may be depressed and anxious because of COVID. You may also, long COVID, right? You may also, because you've had job disruptions, you have financial strains, you can't do what you used to do. So it's so difficult to tease out what is long COVID per se, but what are the effects of having two and a half, three years of what we've been living through? And then uh, I, we kind of, we talked about this a little bit, but but the emotional mental health, I think, can't be underestimated. You know, there, uh, I think that hopefully, at least I'm convinced, there's a lot of connections, right, between the emotional and mental health and your physical well-being. And so impossible to separate them. So it's important, very important, to address the emotional and mental health burden that long COVID is causing, as well as just the effects of the last three years of being in the situation that we've all been in. And mostly the, the people benefit from um, cognitive behavioral therapy, from counseling, um, uh, graded exercise programs, programs that, you know, bring them joy to things that, that they, they, you know, that will hopefully um, uplift both their mood and their, their, their physical symptoms. A couple of things about long COVID in children, um, less well studied. If, if we don't know what we're talking about with adult long COVID, we don't really know what we're talking about with long COVID in children. Harder to get information from children about this. Um, we initially thought that, you know, COVID wasn't going to be a big deal in, in kids, but that wasn't the case in everyone. And so there certainly is the syndrome of long COVID in, in, in children and teens. Risk factors I have outlined here, um, you know, or, or things that we see symptom-wise, uh, those with, with a history of asthma or hyper airway reactivity appear to be more, um, more prone to long COVID symptoms. Um, anxiety and depression, difficulty with school, those are the kind of things that, similar to adults in terms of att attention and mem memory, um, seem to be most be, uh, reported. I wanted to just touch briefly on something called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, right? This is a very rare um, condition that does appear to uh, more commonly affect children 
as a consequence of acute COVID infection than adults. And what this is, is usually two to four, two to six weeks after initial infection with COVID, children presenting with acute fever and very sick, requiring hospitalization most of the time. Fever, rash, and GI symptoms like abdominal pain, nausea, those are the kind of constellation of symptoms. And this, as we mentioned, inflammation, this appears to be all an overactive inflammatory response that then starts to break down the function of, of multiple organ systems. And it, it, it frequently involves the heart. If you're looking at this condition, it appears to be more common in males and more common in that middle age group, like the five to nine, not the really little babies and not as much the teens, okay? And you'll see here also that there's a notable ethnicity difference. Hispanic, black, more prevalent than in the Caucasian population. We probably don't have great data on the Alaska uh, Indian, uh, Alaska Native uh, American Indian population, um, but doesn't appear to be a huge prevalence in, in that population. Okay, so treatments. As I mentioned, supportive rehab, that's really where it's at right now. There's many, many medications that are being studied. Most of them are aimed at rebalancing that renin angiotensin system that we talked about, upping the antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties, decreasing inflammation. I just feel it's interesting, so I wanted to share a little bit without fully endorsing anything, please, but, but just to show you where the research is going, okay? Melatonin, this is a safe drug known for a long time, it's a hormone, actually, that's released deep in the brain, commonly associated with trying to improve sleep in a fairly non-heavy-duty uh, uh, way, right? Also being studied for long COVID because melatonin appears to upregulate certain, um, certain factors in the body that help the body create antioxidants create anti-inflammatory mediators. And so this is kind of very interesting to me that um, you know you like to try to do, choose drugs that have a good safety profile if you're gonna try drugs for long COVID. And so melatonin I think does meet that in the sense that it has a good safety profile. It's been used um, to treat sleep disorders in particular um, for, for some time. So uh, I, I wanted to share with you that this is the kind of where the research is going. And, and I feel like this is an interesting drug to look at because it does have a, a, a good safety profile. Lots of other drugs under review, as I mentioned. Statins, a lot of people are on them for lipid lowering effects, but they also have anti-inflammatory effects that we're learning about. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and, and receptor blockers, those are used commonly for blood pressure control. Also possibly because as we mentioned, this is the system that this virus works on. So there's interest in whether those drugs could have impact on long COVID. Lots of discussion about anti-inflammatory mediator blockers, antibodies that block the natural inflammatory mediators in the body. Tumor necrosis factor, that's a TNF. Interleukin is in IL-6. Antivirals, uh, commonly uh, we hear about Paxlovid, right? There's some small studies that show that people who take that as a treatment per se of long COVID seem to have an improvement in their symptoms. Same with the COVID vaccine. Uh, so I think that's some interesting research we'll hopefully hear more about. Prognosis. Back to the study that I showed you about the patients in Wuhan, China. This to me gives me some hope. At one year, those patients were looked at again, all right? Unfortunately, 50% still had at least one persistent symptom, but that was lower than when they looked at six months. So it's bad in the sense that many patients are still reporting symptoms. I'd like to think 
especially with the fact that 88% of them had returned to their work, that the trajectory here hopefully is showing us that most patients will improve, but it's going to take time for many of them. Of course, much, much, much that we don't know. Um, we're just getting started. I had to add a few of these. I was a history and medicine major, so I find it fascinating to look at other epidemics and what we learned even years, years later. So a couple things that I found really interesting. We all heard about the 1918-1919 flu, sometimes known as the Spanish flu. This is an H1N1 pandemic. Many, many years later, they looked at birth cohorts of people who were born in the years during that pandemic, all right? And actually, another study that I'll talk about in Helsinki, Finland, but let me show you this one on the 1819 uh, pandemic. This is uh, on the left, the graph of the um, rate of cardiovascular disease in young people born by, by a uh, year. And you see that this study is suggesting that in their, middle, in their later uh, adult years, 60 to 82 range, those who were born during the pandemic actually had more cardiovascular disease than the birth cohorts before or after. Looking at some data from military recruits, they also seem to be shorter than their peers in age born before the pandemic or after. So, so interesting, again, wouldn't make too much of it in the sense that when you have a pandemic, especially in this era, you have other healthcare issues, you have economic things that happen, changes in food. So no, there's not any direct relationship necessarily be had, but it does show you that these epidemics, these pandemics have long sequela that who knows what we don't know what the future will hold. Okay, so hopefully um, uh, we're just getting started with this and we'll learn a lot more. Um, the NIH has committed over a billion dollars in grant, grants to study long COVID in recognition that this is going to be something that we need to know a lot more about. Uh, for those who unfortunately are not able to return to their usual state of health, um, the American Disabilities Act um, now has provisions for covering some patients who have long COVID symptoms and cannot uh, return to work in their usual fashion, as does Social Security Disability Insurance. If you look on research uh, blogs and whatnot, this is not easy It's it, for many reasons. It's not easy necessarily to work with an insurer or work with a, a workplace or whatnot to address these things because we're, we, we're challenged by diagnosis and, and the complexity of, of being able to characterize what is long COVID. But there is, uh, there is much work being done um, to, to address this. And I can't end the pre a presentation about COVID without making a pitch for the COVID vaccine because the only way you can't get long COVID is if you don't get COVID. And so we need to continue to emphasize the value of the vaccine. Uh, even if people get infected after being vaccinated, boosted, and doing all the right things, uh, I believe the evidence is strong that their, their probability of getting through both their acute COVID illness as well as having long COVID symptoms is reduced. So. Anyone who is still uh, waiting or for those of you who have young children who are recently eligible for the vaccine, I would definitely feel that that is um, your strongest protection against both COVID and long COVID. So last slide, summary points. Many people who have acute COVID experience long-term symptoms weeks to months after recovery. Risk of long COVID is not directly linked to how sick they were during their acute COVID infection. Inflammation appears to be the key player in terms of the etiology of long COVID symptoms. The best we have to offer right now is a multidisciplinary 
rehabilitative approach, emphasizing non-drug treatments for long COVID. And that there's lots more to come on this topic because research is ongoing about treatments and the trajectory of this illness. And so hopefully we will have a lot more to discuss in, in, in months to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um,